I'd like to welcome everyone to the presentation today. My name is Joe DeFranco. I'm with Construction Safety Experts. Today we'll be reviewing safe scaffolding procedures and OSHA inspections. A uh, little information on our company, Construction Safety Experts. We conduct crane operator training, practical and written uh, testing, annual equipment inspections, rigor and signal person training, accident investigations, program and job site evaluations. Um, you can see their OSHA citation reviews. We'll be talking about that today. Uh, we also do mock OSHA site audits if you um, need us to come by and do some third-party evaluations, that type of thing. And scaffold hazard awareness, user, and competent person training. We'll talk about all of that coming up. When we talk about OSHA inspections, how are they conducted? Uh, the OSHA Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, authorizes compliance officers to conduct workplace inspection at reasonable times. OSHA conducts inspections without advance notice, except in rare circumstances. Uh, imminent danger, for example, we'll get into the definition of that coming up. Uh, so anyone that tells an employer about an OSHA inspection in advance can actually receive fines and a jail sentence for that. We look at our inspection priorities here. And the first priority is the imminent danger that gets top prior priority. And the definition of imminent danger, there is reasonable certainty that a danger exists that can be expected to cause death or serious physical harm immediately. So an example of that, someone working on a scaffold uh, without guardrails or any means of fall protection, employees working in a trench, um, an unstable trench without any protective systems in place, those would be examples of imminent danger. The next priority is a fatality. Uh, worker fatality or, or hospitalization of three or more employees is the next uh, prior, priority level we see there. Then complaints and referrals. And we also have programmed inspections. OSHA might have a special emphasis program for a certain exposure, for example. Also keep in mind, if your company is working on mine sites, MSHA conducts inspections at those locations, and they they do inspections at least quarterly, um, so they have a little different system than OSHA in place. If we look at the most frequently cited serious violations in the construction industry, we can see most have to do with falls, uh, ladder use, and then you can see the scaffold categories, fall protection, access, platform construction. So we'll definitely take a look at the importance of having a good scaffold program and, and documented training in place. When we look at specific scaffold citations, we can see for not having the appropriate harness and lanyards, working above 10 feet without fall protection, uh, inadequate access, poor platform construction, and then lack of training for users in particular. If we look at the violation types and penalties, basically different categories if you were to receive a, a citation. The first level we talk about is an other than serious type of violation. That has a direct relationship to safety and health, but probably won't cause a, a serious physical harm. And the penalties can be up to $7,000 for an other than serious type of violation. The next level we talk about is a serious violation. And that's where there's the potential for serious injury, injury or even a fatality. Uh, crane and rigging violations, scaffold, fall protection, electrical. These are always going to be at least a serious type of violation because the potential does exist for serious injury. Mandatory penalty for serious violations, it can be up to $7,000 uh, per occurrence. Then we have a willful violation. That means that the employer uh, intentionally basically commits a violation. They knew they were trained for whatever reason they chose not to implement the uh, protective system. And we can have a penalty amount there of up to $70,000 for each willful violation and a minimum penalty of $5,000 for a willful violation. Uh, the most common type in uh, the crane and rigging world has to do with our documentation of inspections and this applies to other areas as well. If we have a documented deficiency but we're still using the equipment for example, that could be a willful type of violation. Repeated violation, a violation that is the same or similar to a previous violation. Uh, 
throughout the company. It doesn't have to be on the same exact project, but it, it is with the employer, and there can be penalties of up to $70,000 for a repeat type of violation. So something like this that we're looking at, uh, this would be at least a serious violation. We can see there employees above 10 feet, uh, no fall protection in place, no guardrails, personal fall arrest system. Uh, those are the items we would be looking at. OSHA can also assess penalties uh, for failure to abate. If we have uh, each day an employer fails to correct a previously cited violation, $7,000 for that. Falsifying information, fine of up to $10,000 or six months in jail for giving false information to OSHA. And violation of posting, we have to post the citations and abatement verification for three days or until the hazard is corrected. It has to be near the violation or at a central location. And if we fail to do that, $7,000 for the violation there. OSHA can also adjust the penalties downward uh, depending on the gravity of the violation, efforts to comply with the act and history of previous violations, uh, what type of written programs and training, and all these things do we have in place. There's also an appeals process if we do receive uh, citations. We have the right to disagree with or appeal parts or all of the OSHA citation. We can request an informal conference to discuss the case or reach it. And at this conference, we can reach a, a settlement agreement with OSHA and that adjusts the penalties in order to avoid prolonged legal disputes. If we decide to contest the citation, the abatement date or the proposed penalty, it must be done within 15 days of the contest period. How do we prepare for an OSHA inspection? Several steps that we want to take into account. We can see here part one, selecting a company representative. So all of these things really need to be uh, done ahead of time. We don't want to wait till OSHA shows up on the project or at the, the office. We want to have the, the training and these systems in place. So selecting a company representative, one of the most important steps and the representatives, the individual charged with representing the company's interests during the inspection. Ideally, the safety director is someone in upper management, well versed in the standards that apply to their type of business and the health and safety programs. Also, location of required records, your written corporate safety and hazardous communication manuals, for example, the OSHA 300 logs, everything that we'd want to have in place there. Company representative supervises the OSHA inspection. If they're not on site, we can ask the inspector to wait for the arrival of the representative before starting the inspection. I'd actually have uh, compliance officers in one situation. Um, one of my clients was doing a project out of town, and, and the compliance officer was nice enough to wait four hours for me to arrive on site um, as the company representative. So uh, they will do that generally. and. Um, we want to make sure we ask that question. Some of the duties of the company representative, attending the opening and closing conferences, accompanying and recording all aspects of the walk-around inspection when the compliance officer does their inspection of the job site. That includes areas of the workplace inspected, the names of any employees and supervisors interviewed, and identification of any photos, measurements, and samples taken. Uh, the notes of the company representative should remain confidential. Also, photographing all areas of the facility inspected, making certain to take side-by-side -side photographs. So whatever the OSHA compliance officer takes a picture of, we generally want to take the same picture. Uh, videos also recommend taking pictures at different angles, and videos may show um, different things that we might want to take into account. Also, the company representative responds to all document and information requests by the OSHA inspector. Make sure that all non-managerial employees are aware of their rights during an OSHA interview. OSHA will generally conduct uh, employee and manager interviews, supervisor interviews as part of their on-site inspections. Uh, attend and assist in all interviews of management employees. Also, keeping the inspection under control. The OSHA Act says that 
The inspections take place at reasonable times within reasonable limits with the exercise of good judgment. The representative should not allow the inspection, inspection to interfere with work in progress or run beyond normal working hours, for example. We don't want to admit any violations or unsafe practices, but we also want to correct any observed violations as soon as possible. Company representative uh, continued some of the duties here, consulting with the company's legal counsel about difficult or special problems, such as warrants or subpoenas, and allow counsel to deal directly with the OSHA inspector as necessary. So we want to be courteous and polite, but still want to protect our rights. Uh, again, advanced preparation is what we're looking for here. Don't be afraid to ask questions during the inspection process. Why the facility was chosen? Is it employee complaint or referral? Uh, ask to see a copy of that written complaint if there is one. Confirm with the inspector what they want uh, to do and what they want to see and how long they ex expect to be on, at the work site. Reach an understanding that the inspection is limited to the areas um, listed in the complaint. So, for example, if there were com there was a complaint about a defective forklift, we'd want to bring the compliance officer to that forklift and not expand the inspection unnecessarily. The next part that we come to is the opening conference and record request of the inspection. Most inspections start with an unannounced visit by a compliance officer and an opening conference. The purpose of the conference is to lay out what will happen during the inspection. Use the opening conference as an opportunity to start uh, taking control of the inspection, man help manage, manage that inspection. Some of the following tips we can keep in mind. Ask to see the inspector, inspector's credentials if they don't offer them initially. Uh, an employer also has the right to get a warrant before an inspection is made, so that's something to consider. Identify the company representative. Uh, they're designated to supervise the inspection. Inform the inspector of that. They should coordinate all of their activities through the representative. Discuss any safety issues that may be encountered during the inspection. Uh, what personal protective equipment, PPE, is required on the site. Make sure the compliance officer uh, is in compliance with all the site requirements. Identify areas in the workplace or documents that might reveal trade secrets. Those are things we want to review with the compliance officer. Again, take good notes of all uh, matters discussed at the opening conference. We might need to refer to those at a later date. Record requests during the uh, opening conference or, or some point during the inspection, the inspect inspector will ask to see certain records. So to avoid later misunderstanding, it's a good uh, practice to have these requ requests in writing or an email. As a general rule, we don't want to volunteer any documents or information, but provide what is requested and required. We need to distinguish between records that are required under the standards and those that are not. So examples of required documents, again, the Hazardous Communication Program, your OSHA 300, 301, and 300A logs reporting of recordable uh, injuries on your site, we'd have to produce those type of records. Certain records not required by the standards, that would be another situation. So if they're asking for detailed records that maybe aren't necessarily required. You might be helping the inspector to find and document violations. So as to these documents, the best practice is to defer requests until you have a chance to look at the documents and review them with upper management or your legal counsel. And we can see the objections there, overly burdensome, uh, too much time and effort to comply, irrelevant to the investigation or legally protected from disclosure. So before uh, producing any records, we want to make sure they're complete and accurate, so we want to review those prior to submitting. Uh, the next part of the inspection process, the walk-around inspection, uh, one of the most important phases of the inspection. In many cases, the majority of, the, of OSHA's evidence as to whether a violation exists results from the efforts 
of the inspector during the walk around inspection. So they have to really prove there's a violation and that's why I'll go through the interviews and take the photos and ask all the questions and review the pro written programs to to prove there are violations. So some of the things to keep in mind during the walk around inspection, again the law provides that a representative of the employer is given an opportunity to accompany the inspector. Typically the inspector again photographs or videotapes the workplace they might take measurements, uh, air sampling, environmental sampling, noise measurements, depending on the type of inspection involved. And unless a trade secret is involved, the employer generally has no right to object. We, we do need to allow that. If the inspector wishes uh, to inspect areas not related to the purpose of the inspection, we should ask the question why and, and discuss that. If there's complex health uh, inspections involving air sampling, ergonomic hazards, for example, we'd want to have our own designated expert accompany and monitor those portions of the inspection, do side-by-side -side testing. It's the best approach there. During the, the walk-around inspection, uh, many cases, there's going to be unsafe conditions that are observed. If possible, we should correct those unsafe conditions and uh, in the event that a citation is issued, by correcting those items immediately, this will demonstrate your good faith and may result in a lower penalty. If we fail to correct any unsafe conditions, it could result in higher penalties or even the willful violation that we talked about. We also might have employee and supervisor interviews as part of the inspection process. The guidelines are different for the two. The OSHA Act for employee interviews gives employees the right to speak privately with OSHA. For that reason, employer representatives are generally not entitled to be present for non-supervisory interviews. And if they're not supervision, generally uh, individuals without authority to hire, fire, uh, discipline, or direct, or control the work would be non-supervisory. Employers should be guided by their own determination in which employees are considered supervision and get advice from your counsel if there are any questions there. Even though employer representatives are not often present during interviews, they can and should take the following actions to prepare employees. So inform employees that they have the right to speak or not to speak to OSHA. Inform employees they may request a representative including a supervisor, a union representative, an interpreter, for example, to sit in on the interview. Uh, OSHA may resist the presence of an employer representative during the interview, however. Put employees at ease and give them a heads up as to what OSHA inspector is likely to ask. They're going to probably be quizzed on the safety training or facts surrounding any alleged violations, so we can advise them to tell the truth but remind them of, of some of the training programs and, and procedures that we have put in place. Intercede on behalf of employees who, have, who may be distraught or physically unable to speak with OSHA. If there was a fatality or a major accident, employees and supervisors should not be interviewed until they feel physically and emotionally able to do so. So that's not an unreasonable request. Conduct a, a voluntary debriefing of all employees interviewed by OSHA when informing employees of their rights and or debriefing them. Avoid any pressure, coercion, okay? Uh, OSHA prohibits retaliation or discrimination against an employee participating in an inspection. Always tell the employee that it is their free choice as to how they wish to conduct the interview. Simply advise them of their rights. And again, we can nothing that says we can't remind them of the policies and procedures and training um, and, and some of the good things that we have in place. Supervisor interviews are, are another uh, matter. The statements and admissions of supervisors may legally bind the company. So the following guidelines should be observed. The employer's representative has the right to be present for supervisor or management interviews and should always uh, exercise that right. Also, where possible, minimize extensive uh, management interviews by having the designated employee representative respond to OSHA's requests or information is another thing we want to keep in mind there. 
We're going to also have a closing conference here in this slide. At the conclusion of the inspection, the inspector will hold a closing conference to discuss the observed violations. Don't be afraid to ask questions again. Uh, what standards are being cited? What is the classification? Are they serious, repeat, uh, non-serious? What classification are we looking at? What is the penalty amount? Most of the time, the inspector won't give any of this information, uh, but it never hurts to ask the questions. We don't want to argue or try to settle the citations with the inspector at the closing conference. Instead, uh, the, the inspector will typically encourage us to in, in schedule an informal conference. Even if we agree with the proposed citations, avoid admitting violations or recognizing hazards, they may, there may be other defenses to the citations that we have not considered. Okay, could it be in an isolated case of employee misconduct, meaning as a company we've trained all of our employees, we have accountability mechanisms in place. Uh, for some reason the employee didn't follow the rules and procedures, so that's one thing we may be able, able to talk about in the future. Tell the inspector where to send the citations. Take good notes at the closing conference. Again, we may need to refer to those at a later date. Typically, the citations are mailed to the employer, and all citations must be issued within six months of the start of the inspection. Upon receipt of the citations, we, have, we are required to post a copy at the workplace inspected. If it's a construction project that is finished, then we would post the citation at the main office, for example. The citation must be posted until the violations are abated or for three working days, whichever is longer. We also have an appeal procedure. So we have 15 days as employers from the receipt of the citation to begin contesting the citation. You can request an informal conference with the OSHA area office to negotiate a settlement. In most cases, a reduction of the assessed penalty or modification of the abatement date can be obtained. It's also possible to have the citation withdrawn or recategorized to a lesser classification, for example, from a serious to an other than serious. So always recommend scheduling an informal conference. Um, at the very least, we, we've seen uh, reductions in the fine amounts, uh, again, recategorized to, to different violation levels, and we've had a lot of success getting citations deleted. So definitely want to take advantage and, and talk to OSHA about the good policies and procedures and, and controls that your company has in place. Formal appeals are initiated by filing a notice of contest uh, with the OSHA area director within 15 working days of receipt of the citation. If we do want to talk specifically about scaffolds and if OSHA came on the project, what would they be looking for? So things to address in a, in a scaffolding program, the definition of a scaffold, we can see here an elevated temporary work platform, supported scaffold, suspended, or even area lifts is what we would be talking about here. So definitely see some hazards in this particular photo that we'd want to get addressed. As well as this one, uh, aerial lifts. Uh, if we have uh, boom type lifts here, this particular lift is rated for uh, two employees. We have three people working in the lift. We can see no fall protection in place. So again, all these would be serious type of violations um, that we'd want to avoid. Talking about hazards when working on scaffolds here, basically falls from elevations, struck by hazards, tools or debris falling, electrocution hazards, are there overhead power lines in the work area, scaffold collapse, it wasn't assembled uh, properly or overloaded the scaffold, and then improper damage decking giving way all of these items that we want to take a look at. When we look at scaffold fatalities, we can see the majority of fatalities related to scaffold work results from falls. That's the one we want to pay particular attention to. So how do we protect workers from falls if we're, we have an employee on a scaffold more than 10 feet? Protect them by guardrails, 
and or personal fall arrest system, so a harness and lanyard. So those are the real the, the two main choices, uh, a proper guardrail system, or if the scaffold is incomplete, for example, then a personal fall arrest system, a harness and lanyard in place. Falls may occur when climbing on or off the scaffold, working on unguarded scaffold platforms, or scaffold platforms or planks fail. Also want to verify proper scaffold access. Uh, take a look at our ladder safety inspection and use procedures as well. If we were using a ladder for access in this particular slide, we would want to use an extension ladder secured at the top, extending three feet above the supporting platform. So we want to make sure everything's in compliance there. Scaffolds can only be erected, moved, dismantled, dismantled, or altered under the supervision of a competent person. So when we look at the definition of a competent person in the OSHA standard, someone who's capable of identifying existing and predictable hazards in the workplace, and then they have the authority to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate them. So they, they know what a good scaffold looks like, which there's a lot to... Uh, Keep in mind when we are inspecting a scaffold, a lot of rules and regulations to be in compliance with, and then we have the authority to shut the job down and make sure that deficiency is corrected before we use that scaffold. That is the role of the competent person. So the competent person inspects the scaffold for visible defects before each shift and after any alterations. Deficiencies again corrected before use. Recommend a tagging system and or a checklist for the competent person. Again, there's a lot of items uh, that they would have to keep in mind, so a tagging system and a checklist is a good way to, to help the competent person with their inspections. If we have things like damaged uh, bears, supports, planking, we want to get those items addressed. Also need to talk about scaffold uh, hazard awareness and user training, so the competent person is, is in charge of erecting and inspecting that scaffold, and, and that's each ship. And then anyone that's using the scaffold has to have hazard awareness and user training. So they would be trained on the nature of electrical fall and falling object hazards, how to deal with these hazards, uh, who do they report the, um, the deficiencies to, generally a supervisor, the proper use of the scaffold, and scaffold capacities. So if we look at something like this, uh, clearly competent person not doing their job, uh, scaffold users not doing what they're responsible for. We have probably an overloading situation here, no fall protection, so a number of, of violations we're looking at here. Again, at least serious, could be willful if the training was in place and, and the, the supervisor or the employees chose not to implement those controls. Uh, this next slide, this is an example of a citation uh, for scaffold violations that we've looked at. And you can see here, it addresses the posting requirement. Again, posted immediately in a prominent place at or near the location of the violations that we talked about. And that's until the hazard has been abated or for three working days and then talks about the informal conference procedure there as well. Goes on to talk more about the informal conference. Please bring to the conference all supporting documentation of existing conditions and any corrections made thus far. So if you have citations issued, what have you done to, to remedy that? Uh, bring pictures, okay, videos, any training that you put in place. The results of the informal conference will be a revised citation and notice of no change or an informal settlement agreement. Then we would have the right to contest as well, which is talked about here. In addition, at the bottom it talks about for repeat, willful, and other serious violations, additional documents demonstrating that abatement is completed might be required. So if they're willful or, seri or serious in nature, OSHA might want to see the documentation of those corrective actions you put in place. The next form here talks about the form for the informal conference or contesting citation, so we would mark our item here and mail that in to schedule the informal conference. 
notice to employees of the informal conference form provided uh, with the citation. And then the actual citation on the next slide here. Uh, this particular citation had to do with scaffolds and fall protection. The first one there we can see serious type of violation. The scaffolds were not, were not fully planked or decked and that was a $500 citation amount. Citation 1, item 2, also serious. Each employee on a scaffold more than 10 feet above the lower level was not protected from falling. Again, a $500 citation. And then we have item 3, another serious violation. Employees on the walking working surface with an edge 6 feet or more above the lower level not protected from falling. And that was a $1,400 citation amount. That same citation went on to say the employer, and it was a, also a serious item, the employer did not ensure that each employee has been trained, had not received fall protection training, and that was a $500 citation amount there. In this particular citation, they did want to see a confirmation of abatement for that previous citation, which had to do with the training, 1926-503, so how did they address that? And we were actually uh, able, this, this citation was, uh, the total was $2,900. We were able to get that citation um, deleted for all of the items and no dollar amount owed. And the main reason we were able to do that is because we were able to demonstrate that the employer had an effective safety program in place, written manuals, training, documented training, OSHA 10-hour courses, scaffold, competent person, and user training, everything was well documented, and we were able to argue uh, an isolated case of employee misconduct. So if as an employer you do have all these controls in place and everything's documented and supervisors are, are keeping control of things, if we have an, an instance on a project where an employee uh, doesn't do the right thing, then we might be able to, to use that argument, and that's what we were able to do here. So again, definitely very important to go to that informal conference and have all these control mechanisms in place. The other key thing we had to show was a disciplinary action program. So we do have the training, we spell out the responsibilities for everyone involved, and now we have an accountability program. So we have written reprimands when, when the people aren't in compliance, and that has to be demonstrated and documented as well to make that argument. The next slide here, this is a, a separate citation that also had to do with scaffolds. And you can see here this one, a guardrail, a serious violation for a guardrail system not installed along all open sides of the ends of the platform. And that was a $500 amount citation. And then we had another serious violation where a tow board was not erected along the edge of the platform to protect employees below and that was also a $500 citation amount. So we need to have a tow board so that materials don't fall off the deck to the area below. Also want to consider barricading the area below to keep unauthorized personnel out of that work area. If we're going to stack materials higher than the tow board, then we usually want some additional protection there to keep those materials from falling to the level below. And this citation also went on to have another serious violation. The employer did not ensure that each employee who performs work while on a scaffold was trained. And we see lack of tow boards, incomplete guardrails, guardrails whose ends had protruding flat edge metal pieces and no ramp or similar means uh, provided as access points on the project. And that was a $1,000 um, mount violation that we saw there. In this one, we also went to the informal conference and we were able to get uh, some of the items abated, uh, deleted, and the dollar amount reduced as well there. So we're able to get some of the citations deleted or reduced by showing, again, the effective safety program. So the first thing we want to pay attention to is a, an effective written safety program. Uh, we can see the key items here, Section 20, scaffolds and ladders, aero work platforms, everyone involved with those activities properly trained. 
And when we talk about training, uh, OSHA usually looks for a training certification record. It can be a piece of paper like we see here. We have the topic, uh, scaffold hazard recognition and user training, for example. The instructor's name and signature, the date, date the training was completed. And then the name and signature of the person uh, trained. So it can be a piece of paper, it can be a pocket card, whatever the case may be, but we want to have some documentation, a training certification record. We also want to plan our tasks. Uh, how do we prepare for an OSHA inspection? We would talk about task training. So uh, we see here a safety task assignment form. This is a good tool to plan safety into our work uh, for the supervisors to use. The idea is get the crew together in the morning. And what do we need to do our job today if we're looking at scaffolds? Is it complete? Is it tagged by a competent person? Are all users trained and, and hazards evaded? We should be able to check that off. Complete guardrails or fall protection. So if it's an incomplete scaffold, what kind of fall protection are we going to be required to utilize? Access ladder provided, the proper access for getting on and off the scaffold. Are barricades in place or any other issues? So if scaffolds are involved, we want to look at that particular block of information. We can see here housekeeping, barricades, fall protection. So it's a checklist that the supervisor does in the morning. And then it's a two-page form. Uh, the back, the second page, description of work. What are we doing today? What materials do we need? What potential hazards might we encounter? And how are we going to control those hazards? What equipment? Okay, what rental equipment do we have on site? Safety equipment that we need to use? Are there any chemicals in the work area? And then we review this with, with the crew. Everyone signs off on it. And that's a way to plan safety in every task. So first thing in the morning, it could take five minutes, it could take 20 minutes, depending on how complex the, uh, the work for that day is going to be. We do a safety task assignment with the crew. If we go to a totally different uh, job on the same project or another project, we, we want to take the time and do another safety task assignment. So a very effective way to plan safety into each task. We can also talk about daily or weekly safety meetings, uh, toolbox safety meetings. So generally uh, issued by your corporate safety director, there's a, a topic you might go over with the crew, do some hands-on demonstrations, and then safety topics discussed, any accident prevention suggestions by, uh, by, by anyone involved with the meeting, and then everyone signs off, and that's a way to document our ongoing training. And then we talked about employee reprimand, reprimand citations. So again, we want to define everyone's responsibilities, supervisors and employees. And then we have to have an accountability program to make sure everyone's doing the right thing. So you need to be able to demonstrate uh, an accountability program. A reprimand citation is one way to go about that. Is it an oral warning, a, a written rule warning, termination? What is the type of violation? And even if it's not for the same infraction, if we bring documented employee reprimand citations to informal conferences, then this demonstrates to OSHA that we do have an accountability system in place. So a summary of our OSHA inspections and scaffold use. Uh, we said written programs and procedures for scaffold work and dealing with OSHA inspections. Make sure those are up to date in your corporate safety manual and site-specific safety plans. Also, OSHA postings are in place and required records are up to date, such as our OSHA 300 log. We want to ensure that the competent person and hazard awareness and scaffold user training is completed prior to scaffolding projects. And again, that training is documented on a training certification record. All employees have received safety orientation upon initial hire, and continuing training is documented through the use of effective daily safety task assignments, job safety analysis, and toolbox safety meetings. Also recommend an OSHA 10-hour training for all employees and 30-hour training for supervisors upon initial hire and annually. Uh, when you do the OSHA 10 and 30-hour cor courses, those cards don't expire, but a lot of customers want to see current cards to make sure we do have our annual training taken care of. Also, if we're working on the MSHA sites, training is current uh, for the MSHA training there. So we, we do deal a lot with OSHA, and some 
clients uh, give us a call and they say, well, I got these citations and I don't have really have any any controls or, or past training or, or anything in place, and that's when it's difficult to go to an informal conference. And really the best approach then is saying, you know, we're working with this particular company and we're updating their controls and processes, and they, they usually look favorably upon that. The better approach is to have all of these items in place and, and the accountability programs and and you're taking care of things every day through safety task assignments and, and your strong safety program, and then these things will be there when we need them. Also, crane operators, if we're talking about equipment, uh, operators are, crane operators are certified, riggers and signal persons, forklift and area lift operators qualified, so again, a training certification record for that. And also equipment inspections are documented, so you know how do we prepare for OSHA inspection, make sure all your paperwork is accurate, everything's up to date, all the, the training is documented. Program for managing uh, OSHA inspections in place and includes training for employees and supervisors, and again, designating a company representative, so you want to have that as part of your supervisor and employee training. And again, accountability systems in place and disciplinary action program. Another way we can prepare for, for site uh, OSHA inspections would be frequent site audits conducted by supervisors and mock OSHA inspections or walk-around inspections by your safety directors, insurance providers, and consultants. So uh, let your, your company or consultants find what areas you're lacking in and, and focus on training before OSHA uh, does come and do a, a site inspection. If citations are issued, again, informal settlement uh, conferences and appeal procedures can be utilized to reduce citations or get them deleted. And again, your safety director, legal counsel, insurance provider, consultants are good resources there. Plans in place for upper management to meet with customers, owners, or general contractors if citations are issued on their site. So generally, if OSHA comes on a project, um, and their citations issues, uh, your customers might not be happy with that, so you want to have a plan in place to meet with them and review how, are you, how you're dealing with these citations and, and what controls you're, you're putting in place going forward. So this completes our overview of the uh, safe staffing procedures and OSHA inspections. Uh, please give me a call if you have any questions or if we can assist with any training or inspection needs. You can see my phone number there, 919-417-2139, and I do appreciate your time today.